everyone. Uh, today, I am Shirley Fenton, Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that you were able to join us today, and those of you coming in through the webcast, welcome as well. This is a, a Smarter Health seminar at the University of Waterloo, and this seminar is part of our series in eHealth Strategies. A special welcome to our speaker, Ernie Wallace, Executive Lead, Strategic Initiative from Smart Systems for Health Agency. Also, a special thank you to our seminar series. You'll see them listed across here, uh, Blackberry, Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada, McKesson Canada, Smart Systems for Health Agency, and Borden, Ladner, and Gervais. So thank you so much for being our seminar sponsors. Before I start, I have a few announcements. Our, our next seminar is, uh, will be held on Wednesday, April 26th. Dr. Judith Shamian, President and CEO of BON Canada, will be our speaker. She'll be talking on new strategies for healthcare in the home. Judith is a dynamic speaker. I, I'm sure you'll enjoy it if you come and hear her speak. The next Health Informatics Boot Camp will be held in Toronto April 5 to April 8. You can register for the boot camp on our website. We just held a two-day intensive workshop for health privacy professionals last week, and we're planning on giving this workshop again in Ottawa this spring. We're taking pre-registrations for that right now, again on our website. The purpose of the eHealth seminar series is to examine the Canadian and Ontario eHealth strategies in detail. These seminars give us the chance to learn more about these strategies and to critically evaluate their progress. So our agenda today will be as follows. Ernie will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. This will be followed by a facilitated discussion where you can ask your questions. And I welcome those coming in through the webcast to get their questions in as well. We'll ask them for you. If you ask a question, please wait until you get the mic. We'll be running around with uh, handheld mics to get the mic to you so you can have, uh, speak into the mic, hold the mic towards you uh, when you give your question, and that will be recorded on the uh, webcast and the videotape of this session as well. For those of you that are here to get a BlackBerry, that draw will be held at the end of the session. Uh, we've got uh, our names and our special electronic gizmo, and uh, so we'll be doing that draw at the very end. So without any further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dominic Covey, the founding director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. He'll introduce our speaker. Thank you, Shirley. I appreciate that. Uh, the, uh, by the way, I think what we should do at the end of the session is have the uh, uh, pull the draw things put in Ernie's hat because it's such an outstanding hat. We'll actually get him to model it at the end of the program. So uh, I met them up uh, coming through, I, and I didn't remember. I met Ernie once before, and uh, there were these two strange people walking through the building earlier today. I said, you must be looking for us. And I was right, right on the first shot. So uh, Ernie... Uh, Ernie's background is so interesting and, uh, and, and diverse. I've asked him to take a couple minutes of his talk to talk about some of the things he's done. He brings an absolute wealth of experience. We had an opportunity to talk for several hours today, and his background uh, related to business systems and uh, uh, ERP, enter enter enterprise resource planning systems, and so on, has, is absolutely amazing. So I think that uh, Ernie comes not just with the healthcare background, but with other industries and consulting experience and so on, uh, giving us kind of a different viewpoint. He's been uh, 25 years of managerial experience in the public and private sectors. He's worked on large IT projects. Uh, we've learned that his term executive lead was a default uh, title that he received uh, as a uh, kind of a booby prize, I gather, from after discussions with the Ministry of Smart Systems for Health. Um, I can tell you after our discussions that... Uh, there are almost any question that you can ask about IT management, Ernie will have, uh, I think, a really uh, something to say about and probably a reasonably good answer to. Ernie is responsible for re leading the Ontario Laboratories Information System, which, as you know, is one of the strategic projects of the uh, Smart Systems for Health Agency Ministry of Health in Ontario. It's one of the key projects being delivered. And uh, he's been... Uh, regaling us today with some of the realities of that project, and I'm sure he'll do the same thing for you. Ernie, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, 
how about that? We can, make, we can make the technology work. Thank you very much for inviting me out, and uh, I'm impressed that there's many people want to come out and talk about this subject uh, as such. So we'll, we'll take a quick run through it, and let's be real, it's a very, very high level uh, run through about some of the things that uh, are going on with OLIS and the reasons and rationale for it. And then hopefully we can engage in some dialogue uh, rather than just questions about things that you might like to know about it in terms of where we're doing. I've been told to uh, keep the techie side down on this, and that's a good thing because I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer about uh, some of the architectures and that. However, uh, having questions at the end is, is a really good thing because Lindsay Campbell, who's with me and who has been with the project far longer than I have and has a background in uh, labs and labs information system, will be able to stand up and help answer the questions. So Lindsay is my manager of uh, client engagement and change management and has largely been responsible for the adoption strategy, which we'll talk a lot about as we go forward uh, in terms of where we're at. Um, so we are going to go very, very quickly through it. Um, but uh, as Dominic said, uh, he thought you might be interested in my background. First off, I get to you know, have a honeymoon and say I don't know quite a bit because I've only actually taken this job on for the last six months. So I arrived in Toronto uh, effectively at the beginning of October and inherited the project. I should also point out, despite the, the slide, I am an employee of Smart Systems, but I was engaged to, uh, and which is actually very much of a change in how things have been done in the past and the fact that I report to Don Ogram and actually the ministry. I actually have the responsibility of the Ministry of Health for the project. I also report into the health office and as well to Smart Systems. So for the first time, I think, in the project's history, uh, we brought all the various major players together, and I have complete and total responsibility both for the development project and for what is now the adoption project, which we're running as a separate project. So Although that may not be significant from your viewpoint, I can tell you that from uh, an e-health and large IT project viewpoint, um, it, is a, it is a change. Uh, all the players and all the stakeholders involved uh, usually protect their territory um, quite a bit. So we were kidding earlier about my hats, which Dominic likes. I was sort of make sure to keep my black hat on since I'm kind of representing the ministry and it's kind of budget day or the day before budget day, but we decided maybe since it's being filmed, we wouldn't do that. Um, Quick, very quick background. Um, somebody asked me what I, you know, my background, what I've done. Uh, literally for the last, you know, I'd say 20 years, I have been in what a ch I call a change agent mode. Um, so usually if something needed fixing, I was brought on, or if something needed taking apart, I was brought in. And that's kind of been the history. I spent about half my career in government, in the federal government, and about half in the private sector. Uh, most of my career in government was spent with Health and Welfare Canada, mainly on the welfare side, although I did have some parts to do with the health side and the disability side of it. Um, I then spent uh, part of my, my private sector with EDS, which you may be familiar with as a large systems integrator, with PricewaterhouseCoopers in various roles. And the last job I had before I arrived here is I was brought in um, to create the CIO's job and an IT services organization for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the portfolio, which actually is a fairly large, fairly not health, human health oriented, but obviously with BSE in that uh, uh, interesting area to work. Uh, we supported a number of agencies. Uh, I think people realize that the department itself is about 9,000 people, Canadian Food Inspection Engineering about 7,000 people, and we were supporting 52 labs across the country and about 135 sites on top of that. And, uh, I was largely brought in and spent three and a half years creating the CIO's job and the, and the organization to support their change mode. Um, sort of having done that and turned it over to my, my uh, successor, um, I happened to have a conversation with Mike Conley, who's the CEO for SSHA, and he said, hey, have you ever thought of moving to Toronto and you know, kind of coming down and taking some things on down here? And he uh, talked me into it. So I arrived here in October. So I'm new to Toronto, relatively new to the health field, uh, I am not new to very large change projects and very large IT projects. In fact, that's most of been my background in terms of uh, success in the last little while. So uh, we can see what happens. So I'll, I'll pass the, the detailed health systems questions over to Lindsay and we'll see what we can do with the rest. What we want to do is set some stage and just sort of um, uh, kind of give some context and then we want to talk a little bit about what all this is. I really want to focus on OLIS, um, you know, and I assume everybody knows what OLIS is, but the you know, Ontario Lab Information System, or if you, you'll see JLIS, which is the InfoWay conversation, which is Jurisdictional Lab Information Systems. We have other acronyms, and you'll have to remind me. Um, so we'll talk about what it is. Um, we can talk a little bit about, about how it's developed and some of the issues around that. 
I think the real issue with this is that this is the first real application out the door of the size and scope that it is from an e-health viewpoint, the sort of first operational application. There's other, it's not to say that there's not other work going on in other areas. There has been with drugs and others, but not anything approaching uh, the size and scope and the, the number of players that get touched by this particular system. And I think that's kind of where we're going to focus is, is, you know, what does it mean and what is, what is it driving out? So it, first out the gate, sometimes it has an advantage. Sometimes it has a disadvantage as you go forward because you're the one that's going to run into the issues that, that people have had hidden and, and now not need to deal with. So we'll probably talk a lot about that. Um, just as a, a, a comment overall with healthcare, and you're probably as well aware of this as I am, um, in terms of that whole field and whether you call it e-health or, or the automation or whatever, uh, there's been a lot of good things go on, okay? There's a lot of work been done. Um, you know, there's probably equally so the disasters in this field as there has been in other systems fields and other, in other areas. But there's been a lot of work to, done in a lot of areas, somewhat splintered, somewhat, you know, segregated, uh, you know, by area or by particular discipline. Uh, there's a long ways to go. Okay, um, I think anybody who thinks that we're on the verge of a fully integrated, implemented e-health system is not recognizing reality. But we've come a long ways. There's a lot of things happening, and I think that there, there is an opportunity to move that agenda forward uh, a, lo a lot in terms of where we're headed, both from a, any viewpoint, from a clinician's viewpoint, from a patient's viewpoint, from the overall system's viewpoint. And this is just one initiative. It happens to be out the door first. It happens to have a lot of visibility. Um, the benefits of the e-health system, um, if you haven't you know, read and beat to death with it or had it justified, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, you live this. Um, it's probably true in other areas, but uh, I think most people believe that the cost and nature of the system is such that you're going to have to move to an e-health world and that the benefits are very obvious in terms of accuracy, duplication, how we spend money, getting the results right, patient service, wait times, whatever the flavor of view you want to come from. So I think that, that it's been pretty much accepted. Now, you can get into a huge definitional argument about what e-health really is, and uh, quite frankly, it doesn't matter from my viewpoint. I mean, I think people have their own view coming from where they're at, what jobs they have, whether you're a physician, whether you're a patient, whether you're running a hospital, whether you're running a lab, or whether you're in a university. Uh, they're all probably valid, and they all intersect at some point in time. Uh, I, I borrowed this, and I think, you know, the, the, the whole point about e-health systems and to a certain extent OLIS in its own way is not to focus on process and not to focus on institutions, but to focus on information and information as it relates to uh, our clients, patients, and, and, and the bottom line, okay? So it's the fact that, you know, and they, this is a diagram that many of you may have seen. It's about bringing all those things together. In this case, we're talking about lab information or test results um, in terms of that side of it. Uh, but I think, you know, this is, again, probably repeating history. OLIS just happens to be one element along that path. The other thing is that in the world of e-health and e-health records, um, it's pretty well documented that 60 to 70 percent of clinical decisions uh, are either made or are influenced as a result of test results. Um, you know, and I think that itself shows the importance of, of OLIS, if you want, when you start to talk about an e-health system and an e-health record. And I think that's another reason why it's getting, you know, the attention that it is. The architecture, uh, this is a very, very, for the, for the techies in the room, this is a very simplified diagram, uh, which we've borrowed. But fundamentally, with the, the, uh, the interface layers and, and the, the repository sort of approach, the application approach, it's not at a, at a total level different than the architecture that OLIS is following. So if you looked at it, if you got inside OLIS and looked at the technical layers here with the integration layers and, and um, content management, et cetera, uh, you would not find that this is in variance with the OLIS architecture. Quite frankly, it's probably not at variance with most of the architectures that are being pursued by, by e-health in one way or another. Um, I could give you much more complicated diagrams uh, in terms of where it's at. But in context, it's in terms of, of, of that layer for what OLIS is or isn't in terms of where we're at. 
In terms of the e-health record, um, we tend to focus on this just because it's easier to talk about a total record. And it gives you an idea that, that lab information systems is only one domain. It happens to be the domain that will likely get implemented in its totality first. Clearly, it is, is one of the key components in terms of any e-health record. And again, I'm not going to get into the debate. I've seen many, many different definitions of what an e-health record is, and there are probably at least four or five e-health records around that people will continue to use. So I'm not trying to, to, to you know, go to the all singing, all dancing, but it gives the, the idea that any record has to have these domains in it, and the lab domain, lab information domain, is clearly a critical component of any go-forward scenario that we have. Thought you might be interested in, in, in scope. Um, we were talking uh, earlier at lunch, and I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, there's over 200 million tests a year. In fact, I've seen data that says um, that that number is, quote, official tests that are, are you know, kind of documented uh, in one way or from one view. I have seen data that says there's effectively as many as four times that in the province. Okay? But it gives you a view that, that um, no matter what your definition, this is big. Okay? Uh, we were talking about the fact that when you get, and you'll see later on in the OLA system, when you start talking about queries and that from a large viewpoint, you know, we're, we're looking at steady state kind of views at you know, 400,000 transactions an hour for the technical people in terms of queries, et cetera. So they're very, very large systems that we're playing with. More importantly, some of the other things on the next three areas are um, something that you have to think about, okay? Once we get launched um, into this area, um, the number of players and people involved, okay? Scientists, people, lab technicians, doctors, patients, uh, administrators, uh, people in specimen sessions, people in hospitals, um, 40,000 may be a conservative number. Uh, if you actually followed the wires to the end. Um, and that in itself is one of the things that is um, a challenge and one of the reasons why I think there's been a lot of emphasis on, on OLIS uh, because it actually does touch everybody. There's a lot of other work being done, but it's more targeted on a smaller audience for specific purposes. This is sort of the first um, cross-sector kind of initiative and uh, we'll talk later on about what the challenges are around some of that, and they are a lot of challenges in terms of access, privacy, security, registration. Um, and uh, I'd have to say that if, if I said that OLIS has solved all the problems, that's not true. We think we've so solved enough problems to be operational, but there's still a lot of work to be done as you cross over to that other side of the house. In terms of institutions and, and physical sites and that, uh, you're looking at, at uh, in approximately 200 hospitals, public labs, laboratories, your, your, the 377 patient service centers is probably going up. But it just gives you an idea of scope, of size that this system has to interface with. And we'll talk a little bit why the design and, and what it's actually supposed to do. Again, I would guess that the, the cost of services, this is one estimate you know, using a set of eligible cost criteria. I would suggest to you that if you took all costs into account, it would be significantly higher than that in terms of where we're at. So you might want to keep that in mind, and we can talk later on about the effort that's going into OLIS and has gone, uh, because it's against that backdrop. Very complicated, involves a lot of players, um, and quite frankly, and we talked about this at, at, at lunchtime, the issue is not technology. The issue is infrastructure in various institutions, it's uh, business processes, the business model, it's data, it's standards, it's nomenclature. Um, those are the issues, okay? Um, we tend to like to focus on the technology because it's easier to get at and define and, you know, buy bigger boxes, faster networks, uh, buy another soft package off the, the shelf. Um, the real fact is those other issues don't go away and at, at something of this level, they are the ones that, that are really the challenge. Uh, not only for uh, OLIS as a project, or as a, an operational system, but they are a challenge for everybody that we interface with. And we'll talk again a little bit about that a little later on. Um, 
to say that you're building a system that you're going to implement in any kind of a homogeneous environment is, is like absolutely as far as from the truth as you can get. Um, as we've found out, there are people in every state from operating manual systems to very, very sophisticated systems that we have. For those that already have systems in place, even though they may be using the same vendor, the variation between installs and how they're installed and how they're operated, how they interface with the internal systems is different institution to institution. Right down, and when Dominic and I were laughing about that as to which data gets in which field, okay? So the idea that we have a consistent environment that we're building to um, is just absolutely not true, okay, in terms of where we're at. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is what OLIS is forcing is people to recognize that within their own environments. Um, in terms of the fact that there's some very, very good lab systems out there, very good health information systems, very good uh, client uh, record systems, et cetera, what you find, and I, I, with no names, I mean, we were dealing with a particular large organization. And in real fact, although we kind of looked at it as interfacing with their LIS system, with their lab information system, what we find out when we actually got into it at a granular level was they don't have a, a lab system. They have 14 systems inside, some of which are not exactly integrated. And even some of the data that we were kind of required and thought was kind of standard data, we found didn't exist in the electronic system. And they're one of the more sophisticated ones. In fact, it resided on paper because it was more convenient to keep it on paper. And the example for that is, is, was, in fact, consent, uh, which is kind of a critical element in terms of where we're at. So I just want you to, to have a view here that, that um, OLIS is not designed to replace all these systems, but to the extent that we've been able to design uh, we're going to have to interface to them. Um, OLIS does not solve all those interface problems, and in fact, I think it's surfacing them. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, what is OLIS? Um, maybe I should just give you a, a real quick history lesson, and it also comes out in some of the challenges. OLIS as a project has been around for approximately 14 years, uh, long before my time. Um, so it's not new. And in fact, that's one of the challenges. When you have a project which people perceive has been around for a decade, your credibility is somewhat shot when you start, okay, to say the least. And uh, we were talking later on to the fact that I think um, in the adoption side of this, in the rollout side, one of the problems we've run into is that people didn't actually believe we would get there. And quite frankly, if I looked at the history, I might wonder as well. In real fact, OLIS was never designed to be an interactive real-time system designed to serve physicians in terms of getting tests in and out electronically across you know, the entire uh, province. The original concept for OLIS was around lab restructuring and how to get data on what was going on with labs and lab results, et cetera, and the reimbursement of the whole feeling, I think, at the time, which was that testing was out of control and it was very expensive. Uh, there wasn't a view of it. You also have to understand that in the mid-90s, most of the technology that we take <laughs> for granted today was not there. The capacity to build an OLA system within the e-health context didn't exist. Okay? It was designed for the ministry in terms of managing laboratory kind of test results, not from a test patient viewpoint, but from an overall systems uh, viewpoint. It evolved. The people at the time were doing what they were supposed to do. But you have to understand, the entire environment has changed. Okay? The environment's changed from a technology viewpoint. The environment's changed from a focus viewpoint. E-health, the tools and things that we're going to use for e-health, the funding models, the initiatives and, and that that have been put on the table are really only the last three to five years. And OLIS has had to morph, change, and adopt to that changing factor, okay? So what you see as OLIS, which we'll present, was not at all where it started a decade ago. And I think that's part of what people have forgotten and people, you know, have, have not recognized that that changing environment and changing kind of raison d'etre has, has occurred. So we're moving to a real-time, online, essential component of the e-health system and the e-health record. 
totally different than what was originally the thing. Now, the original concepts are still there, and they're, they're there for research and that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What is OLIS? Um, in simple terms, you know, it's a single information system, you know, Pan Province, okay, that for laboratory test information to be electronically exchanged, both between institutions, between physicians, et cetera. Okay? It's a source system. All right, in terms of what, what, how it exists. So in other words, it is a, you know, largely a, a data repository. People, some people don't like the term repository if you're looking at the privacy legislation. It's a large data warehouse. Okay? Fundamentally, it was designed to connect anybody to anybody from a lab test order results kind of viewpoint. And you'll see that as we talk about the diagrams. The techies on my project team who have been beating their heads about the design and implementation and build of the system don't like it when I say this. From a pure systems functionality viewpoint, it's not remarkable. It's not leading edge from that. You know, an order entry fulfillment, uh, post the results kind of system are around and have been around for a long time in various areas. What gets really interesting is because of the nature of the information, the whole issue around privacy, security, the need for accuracy, the ability to provide access in totally different domains, et cetera, makes it what it is in terms of complexity. The simple functionality of placing an order, somebody conducting a, a test, recording the result, and presenting the result is not, you know, in terms of systems terms, technical terms, unusual. Okay, there's lots of systems that do that. You throw in the nature of the data, the volumes, where it has to go to, what it has to interface with, the whole issues around the need for accuracy and control and security and privacy, and you've got a very, very different situation okay, in terms of where we're at. Oops. Um, OLIS is an integrated province-wide electronic exchange system. I, I've talked about that. Um, its primary design is a repository of test results. Um, one of, we've tried many diagrams, but the, the diagram in terms of the physician encounter, et cetera, it supports the entire process from beginning to end. And we'll talk a little later about some of the implications of OLIS from a business process viewpoint. Um, I think there are people who have only now, literally in the last month, started to realize that once OLIS is fully implemented, um, that it may well change the business model for some people. Um, I mentioned earlier on that the Ministry of Health uh, always had the intention, and it still exists and will be delivered by OLIS, the need in order to turn around and manage the regulatory side of, of, of the ministry. So um, with a pseudonymous repository, with an orders repository and a financial repository, later releases down the road, we'll see an interface directly to the reimbursement systems uh, under the, uh, the health system and the healthcare system in Ontario. It will allow for planning, uh, it'll allow for research, it'll allow for audit. Um, so you'll be able to get at that data. Now I should make it very, very clear, the ministry does not have any access, nor will they have any access to data related to a patient in the sense of, when I say synonymized, in other words, it's, it's, it's the patient side of it's blanked out. They'll be able to see the results, be able to do analysis, but they cannot see uh, results related to an individual. And now they can SSHA, by the way. Okay, in terms of where it's at. It's not designed for that. We'll talk a little bit about the privacy and security issues around that. And, uh, we can go into that in depth if people are interested in it. But the real purpose of OLIS is the clinical repository and consent repository. And that's the part of what I call data in and data viewed. And again, there's a whole set of issues around that in terms of how it's being handled. And OLIS has had to deal with some of those issues in terms of consent and, and the sort of the lockbox approach, which in theory, everybody is going to have to have for any health system, but since we're first up, we're now dealing with the vagaries and the issues about how that actually works or doesn't work for some people in terms of where it's at. So both the original purpose in terms of planning research and financial management control still exist. We will produce those repositories and, and, and they're not about test results to individual, but the overall test scenario that will allow people to look at that either geographically or from a timing issue, et cetera. So what is OLIS? This is, this is our, our one diagram that says um, what OLIS is. And you can see that we've, we've got all of the stakeholders on it. It is a clinical repository. It is a orders in retrieval results out system. And it works on a bilateral basis with all of those that you see on that chart. 
So in other words, people can place orders, results can be posted, and people can pull the results out. So we were asked a question at, at lunch whether a hospital or an institutional lab can pull all of the results back out and store it, and the answer is yes. Okay? So they will be able to do that. It's also designed, however, so that a physician can place an order eventually, independent of a laboratory system, have that order fulfilled, okay, and view the results. That is fairly significant. And the way they do that is also significant in the sense that the intent is that OLIS as a system does not replace your LIS system or your health system or a clinical management system. It's designed to interface to them. It does, however, will allow clinicians through a web portal basis securely to be able to access the results directly. It's largely down at the granular level of tests, and you can obviously link all of the tests historically and across any lab or any specimen collection center to a patient. All right, and that's kind of what this diagram says. So OLIS that we're building, the OLIS system, is the repositories in the gray. It is the interface to hospitals, public labs, community labs, specimen collection centers, et cetera, and to practitioners. It resides on the SSHA secure infrastructure. In other words, it's not building its own telecommunications network. It resides within the SSHA Dena Center. It's using one mail and all of the, the secure messaging facilities of SSHA in terms of where it's at. It really allows for interaction not on just the diagrams that you, you see here, but for example, uh, we were talking to somebody at Clinical Management System and they were looking forward to this for the simple reason that right now there are some bilateral interfaces between specific labs and specific hospitals and hospital to hospital, but not across the province. What in fact OLIS will allow or facilitate, in fact, is communications between those institutions as well via the, the repository. And again, that's somewhat different. And in some cases, somewhat threatening to some of, some of the, the models that are out there in terms of where we're at. Uh, very large, um, one, of the, uh, one of the issues is going to be performance uh, on it. Um, we, are, we have some time in terms of the adoption schedule to talk about that. So when we're up and fully operational, um, it, will be a, it will be a challenge from a performance viewpoint. And, that, and to say right now that we've solved all those problems would be untrue. We know that the problems exist and we have some time to, to actually get at them. Um, Realistically, OLIS itself, and I, I, I think this, this is kind of restating the obvious in terms of, of uh, where we're at in terms of things. So it, it, it promotes, if you want, or helps establish some of the health benefits in terms of, of the accuracy of data, the availability of data. Um, more importantly, it provides an opportunity to look at total data. Uh, by that I mean is there are a lot of closed systems right now systems which people use that are very, very good, but your access to data is, re is strictly related to that closed system. And some of the business models actually promote a closed system because it allows for captured clientele from a business viewpoint in terms of labs. All right? Um, so this is, is there. We're very, very conscious of the need for accuracy. Um, we hope and we believe that it should facilitate uh, patient choice, convenience, accuracy, and timeliness in terms of, of it. I mean, we could go on to other things, but uh, we believe that that will work, all right? Is it all going to be there day one? Absolutely not, okay? And in fact, we'll talk about the fact that the benefits to this system actually um, don't occur till further down the road, all right, in terms of the overall system. Um, without, you know, kind of putting too much on it, clearly, from a government viewpoint, um, they're looking for enhanced accountability, and quite frankly, um, they're hoping to turn around and realize savings out of it somewhere along the line. Although I can tell you, as a project, we don't have that ob objective, okay, in terms of where it was. Um, but clearly, from a government viewpoint, if you can do all of the things that I said and it really works, there should be some better um, management and better uh, use of money in terms of the overall system. Current status, um, we're actually using a systems term, which I was told I was not allowed to use because the ministry has some issues with it right now with privacy. Uh, we're actually ready to go live. 
Uh, in other words, we're operational, ready to receive and send data as of March 31st. Um, that probably doesn't mean much to you. I think people who have been involved in this project uh, long before Ernie, um, this is considered somewhat miraculous that actually you arrive. More importantly, um, I think it's kind of caught some of our early adopters and partners in implementation by surprise. <laughs> Uh, to be blunt, I think people thought that, oh, you know, sometime next year maybe we'll be able to do something. Uh, the fact that we are now at the stage where we actually can start to implement has caught people by surprise. I think people only in the last literally uh, month to two months have went, oops, now we really have to turn around and start to think about how we're going to implement it and what does it mean. We were having a conversation at lunch and people were asking very, very good questions. Okay, about, you know, what does it mean to my internal health record? How do I interface with it? What do I have to change in format? Am I going to have to store it? What does it mean to my vendor relationship? And who pays? What the costs are, et cetera. All really good questions, okay? The fact is, this has been broadcast, lots of people have meetings. I mean, none of this is a surprise. There's not a thing, single thing I'm saying here that hasn't been in the public domain. On the other hand, belief has been suspended, quite frankly. If I had had a project that was around as long as this, I might, you know, kind of wait and see too. But the real fact is we're ready to, to go uh, with some issues. One of the things that we've done, uh, and I didn't bring this as a technical presentation, um, but this project was originally designed to operate over three phases over a, a, a fairly long period of time. Um, and uh, again, it's in the public domain, the OLIS development project all three phases is in the neighborhood of $80 million plus. Uh, somebody asked me, the other, asked me in one of the pre-meetings here, how many people are working on this project? At peak right now, we have 165 people working on the project, all in, which is a fairly healthy run rate uh, in terms of it. Thank God it's a fixed price project, so effectively I'm not necessarily paying for the cost overruns, uh, which is a really good thing. Um, but what has been the focus has largely been around that development and contract management issue, okay? And it has its own problems. However, I would argue that the next part, which is the adoption and deployment, is probably more complicated, more difficult, and more essential. Clearly, building the field of dreams and having nobody use it is not exactly the ideal circumstance. It's only been within the last year and specifically within the last six months that we've switched focus, which includes both funding and management. So we actually have created a separate project for adoption, which also reports to me. And we've done that because treating in client engagement and change management and the rollout as merely a subset or the last end part of a systems development project is probably the wrong answer. So we actually have a focus team separate funding and a separate sort of structure for management in terms of the rollout, in terms of adoption and deployment. It is an incremental approach. Uh, we've engaged a lot of stakeholders. There's been a lot of consultation. We're currently working with what are referred to as the six foundation adopters. They are a subset of what was called the early adopters. I believe there was, what, about 26, 27 early adopters. We collected the six foundation for a number of reasons. We'll talk about the strategy in terms of why and funding. But fundamentally, those six are uh, Gamma, Dynacare, and MDS on the lab side, uh, Lake Ridge Trillium, uh, UHN, and Mount Sinai, the four of the largest hospitals as well as the two labs. Um, might as well deal with the whys and wherefores of, of, of that a little bit uh, as we go forward. But um, the funding model, and we'll talk about it later and the implications of it, is dependent on results. And I'm not talking about results in hooking a hospital up in terms of electronically. It is actually based on the number of records and the target to get paid is 80% of that 200,000 tests in the system and 80% of that 80% viewed or 64% actually pulled out from a viewpoint. And um, for that, uh, the funding attached to that is in excess of $20 million. Now, people sort of go, wow, that's kind of neat to have money. We'll talk again about that a little bit later on. Uh, the real fact is that it is a change because it is performance-driven rollout as opposed to merely handing dollars out and, and paying for activity. 
So the six foundations, first up, Gamma Dynacare and Lake Ridge are our beta tests. They're already working with us. They'll be the first up on the system, uh, followed by the other four. Assuming success, then we'll move out to the others, and it's a three-year rollout plan. I'm being told to hurry. <laughs> um, I think that it, as a catalyst for change, this is probably the most critical element of OLAS. We've kind of touched on it. The fact is that when you talk about an e-health system or an e-health record system, we're now starting to come forward with what does it really mean, okay, in terms of it. We're now talking about a real application with real data that somebody has to store, access, and view. Do I store the data? What about standards, okay? Obviously, data standards and, and common definitions for nomenclature and messaging become critical. We were talking earlier about the fact that people in the messaging part of it, in the, the actual rec recording results, will record which lab. You know, should we have recorded which instrument? Okay, somebody, some people believe. But in fact, you know, where that kind of issue has come out. We've talked about the fact that people are now having to deal with their own world and say, gee whiz, you know, maybe I'm not quite HL7 as standard as I thought I was, and maybe all that integration I'd had inside my box isn't quite what it needs to be. And this is raising those issues. How does this interface? You know, do, how many viewers do we have? How does a physician get at this? What are the issues that have been around for a long time in terms of privacy and security? You know, how do we conform to standards? How far do we have to go along that line before it is? So all of those things, which have always been there, but because we are ready to go and because of the size of what you've seen, it's now surfacing the issues. Not just from an OLAS project or a ministry viewpoint, literally institution by institution. And um, our early adopters and the first two that are up in terms of beta testing uh, will attest to this, okay? That all of a sudden you're going, oops, how does that really work? And how we're we really going to make use of the data, how we're we going to access it, how we're we going to store it. So one of the questions that somebody asked at, at lunch and which has been asked before is, if I am already storing lab information within my own lab system, I can now access OLIS and get at the results across all labs in Ontario. Do I want to do that? Do I want to bring in non, uh, not my lab, but people I'm not partnered with, do I have to change what do I have to change to store that so I can present it internal to my users, or am I better off to have my users go through a web portal interface and access the complete patient result history regardless of lab decisions, okay? And we're not dictating those decisions. We're supporting either decision, either a lab to OLIS interface and the exchange of information and the viewing of information through that interface or through an HIS system or a, a, a clinical management system. We're also supporting the web base in terms of where we're at. Clearly, from a security viewpoint, um, for those who are, have been familiar with it, I mean, registration, authentication, the use of PKI, uh, getting people registered, provider registries, et cetera, now becomes critical. And it's driving out those processes. So processes that worked um, with um, some of the areas that can get 1,000 people registered and get 30 applications certified for PKI, um, now we're talking about tens of thousands and hundreds of certifications, all right? So it, it's driving all of those issues. Um, I keep referred to this, and I actually think this is the challenge of the project. Deployment will be challenging, complex, difficult, and require sustained effort. Um, reason being, we've gone to a multi-release strategy as opposed to the Big Bang strategy. I, I would not recommend anybody try to do this in a big bang, so we've actually moved to multiple releases. So all of the functionality that exists, including some of the order functionality, will not be there day one. So we will have an evolving, developing system in modern technology terms. At the same time, we'll be doing a rollout and implementation across multiple institutions and multiple vendors. We could have as many as 20 vendors working on their interface at the same time. On top of that, there was an ongoing effort to revise and change standards, okay, being driven out. That will also have to be taken into account. We also know that as part of the overall e-health system and e-health record, there are other initiatives that are going on in terms of electronic patient identifiers and records, the need to interface, whether it's drugs programs, the interface which OLIS is designed to support to the public health system. They're all making changes. That's the kind of environment that we're going to roll this out and implement it. Very complex, very difficult. 
We'll talk a little bit about some of the success factors. One of the key success factors or one of the two success factors that I think happens is one is I think there is a lot of belief that's needed. Two, we've got money. Probably maybe I should put two as number one. Um, first question I get asked by virtually everybody. I walk in and do a briefing, anybody. First question I get asked, do you have any money? <laughs> Not doing this unless you've got money. We have significant funding for this for adoption. All right. And that money will be funneled, funneled down to the various institutions based on successful performance. Right? And I'm careful on those words because I think in the past money has been handed out based on activity. In fact, the money in this case is only based on end, end results or performance in terms of where it's at. So I think you know, those, those are critical. Um, some of the things I've just talked about in terms of scope and change and, and that. Um, I think it's been around for a long time. I think that you know, people get weary of it. I think there's conflicting priorities and there's changes within the governance structure. We're rolling out LINs, uh, for example, just as a change in governance, which will have to be taken into account. They clearly weren't there when we started this process, but will be clearly there over the next 36 months as we roll out. So those things will happen. Um, I'm going very quickly. This, is, this slide is really about the commitment to change. Uh, there's been lots and lots of issues raised in every meeting we've been at, but whether I'm dealing with the OHA or the OML or whether I'm dealing with UHN or Trillium or whether we were up in, in Ottawa, there's been very, very few times a six, any in my six months, Lindsay may have had more experience than I, where anybody has stand, stood up and said, no, this is the wrong thing to do. There's a better answer. Um, I don't support this. Disbelief, yeah, I'm not sure you can get there. Cost too much. I'm not sure you make all those interfaces. Um, you know, yakety yak yak. But effectively, we've had nobody stand up and say this is not needed. Wrong answer. Go away. All right? Maybe they're just being polite. We'll see what happens when we get to questions and answers. Um, all this change management planning is, is we had a leading, pra a leading practices review. We have a full client engagement strategy, which has been involving our clients in the beginning, in which they've signed off on. Um, we have a plan which I've referred to. We're not trying to tackle this all at once. So we are dealing with the six foundation. And out of that, we're dealing with two, then four, then the next 20, and that as we go forward. So it's not, and it gives us some time to deal with some of the issues and gives some of our clients and some of the partners time to deal with the issues within their own structures. So is OLIS going to be fully deployed and all the benefits achieved in the next six months? The answer is no. Until it gets completely out, and I guess you're 18 to months to two years before we're sufficiently along the line to really start realizing overall benefits, it'll give us time to do that. And the reason for that, if you're already running an ally, so you're a UHN and you're already hooked partially with Mount Sinai or you're partially hooked in with Gamma, quite frankly, if you're within that closed system, you're not going to see the benefits in the first little while. So I get Gamma to put all our data in. It does nothing for them, right, in terms of what, it, what happened. It's only when we've got sufficient coverage that we're getting that cross, you know, province, doesn't matter which lab, which community uh, treatment, which specimen center, which area you're coming from, and get that, that record in that you'll start to see the benefits and the real, real utilization of it. Um, some of the issues we're dealing with, um, we talked about the changing environment the start, from the time this started to the point where we're actually doing change management and implementation. The whole environment of, is changing. It's under stress. The ministry is reorged. For those, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen that. Yeah, ministry reorganizations, you can say, well, who cares? But effectively, it will have an impact, all right? Um, there's a review going on of SSHA, okay? It will have an impact, okay? There are other programs, EMPI and that, that are well underway and funded in terms of that will have an impact. Um, one of the big areas that we're talking about is with vendors um, in terms of getting them thing. We've tried to avoid the regulatory approach we're right now using the, the incentive of money, consent to, to participate, and hopefully getting people to realize you know, that that's the right answer. We'll see how much progress we make. We are dealing with the vendors. We are trying to do it from a business model, from their perspective, in terms of it. There is, I think, still concerns about privacy and security. I can only tell you, and there would be another hour or two hour presentation to deal with all of the various aspects of how that's being handled. But I can tell you it's been reviewed and will be reviewed again and again and again. 
um, and to the extent that technology and knowledge exists, uh, all of the best practices have been implemented to ensure that it is secure, that it's right, that access is correct. There are some issues. Consent's an issue in how you record it. Consent in our case meaning not just consent between a practitioner and a patient, but right down to a test result. So blocking, for example, on the lockbox that says, I have no problem, you can, everybody can view my specialist, et cetera, et cetera, all these people can view all these tests except for this one test and I only want one person to be able to view it and that's my, you know, whatever. All that has to be taken into consideration and the system accommodates that. However, we accommodate it, whether some of the systems we interface with quite accommodated is another question. <laughs> And that is also driving that initiative. Uh, we have, in fact, I'm meeting with the Privacy Commissioner tomorrow to go through the first cut review again, and it has gone through a whole cons considerable amount of review. Business practice changes. Um, nothing has changed. All this has not changed its direction or how it was intended to operate, but I think people have only just figured it out. Um, for some uh, businesses, it is a problem when you say in the future that a, someone will be able to place an order in OLIS, that a client will be able to go to a specimen collection center of their choice where they chose and that order would be able to pick up. Your results will then be put into OLIS and a physician can view those results directly. Um, if you think of some of the lab business models, particularly in the private sector, eh, that might cause some of them a bit of a problem. All right. so, um, there is some concerns that, that OLIS by its nature will change business practices and business, business processes and we're dealing with that as we go forward. Um, success factors, uh, I'm pretty close to on time. Um, governance and, and commitment from, from, from stakeholders, I, I guess I'm a, uh, living proof, I mean, that, that the people in both the ministry and SSHA and the health office are fairly serious. Um, if they're investing in me personally to come in and try to do this, I mean, I think there's been a pretty much of a hard commitment by senior management that this thing needs to succeed and they are putting the horses and results to it and paying attention to it. In fact, sometimes they're paying too much attention to it from my viewpoint and that's right. I have to live with that. Alignment with some of the other uh, initiatives is clearly, clearly an issue. Um, we, you know, need in the end not to have multiple different viewers and ways of getting that data across the whole EL spectrum, the entire e-health architecture, uh, the approach to, to identity management and, and all that right across, clearly these other things will impact and we need to be able to keep an integrated view and be able to adapt to that kind of change. Standardization, I mean, I kinda, uh, it is, you know, people recognize it, everybody's at a different place on it, we actually have um, and Lindsay is more of an expert, in fact, Lindsay's led that initiative, you can talk to her about where we're at. Have we done all of the data normalization down to the nth degree? The answer is no, you'd never get there. If we waited until everybody agreed to operate on one single standard, we would never get there. Ideal. So we are starting down the road, we are working with InfoWay, we are working with other standards organizations, and we will clearly move to new standards as, as they occur. Uh, we have put out all kinds of, of support templates, et cetera, uh, for people to get ready for this. And Lindsay can talk a little bit more about that when we, we come down. So we have done everything we can to encourage and help people move in that direction, including mapping and using interface tools so that, that you can make it work. Um, the whole consensus on the major issues of privacy, et cetera, multiple standards and that we're working continuously on it and there'll be continuous change. The one factor we do have, which I mentioned before, which is actually slightly unusual. We actually have funding and resources dedicated and focused on this, and we are getting support from right across the sector, whether it's the hospital sector, the lab sector, whether it's city associations, or whether it's individual institutions. I have to, to compliment them, because we have been getting tremendous support from that. You know, when we've asked for people to meet on a technical basis, on a clinical basis, on a business basis, we've had no lack of volunteers to come and work with us and try to figure things out and that, you know, which is to me one of the critical success factors. If you've got people engaged who actually know their business, you've got a better chance of success in terms of doing it. Um, I'm done, I guess. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I didn't have a slide at the end said done, but sorry. <laughs> well, uh, maybe we could ask uh, Lindsay to come up too. I think you're wired for sound. Uh, We've been promised Lindsay can answer all, all the, the technical details, questions. All the technical and detailed questions. So she represents an opportunity for all of us. Uh, 
I'll open up first to questions from you. What, uh, what can we answer for you? Stunned silence. You have a question, put your hand up or a comment. I, I should tell people, that you, you don't know me very well, my team has learned. Um, I'm actually fearless at, at that kind of thing in terms of the background I've come from. So I have not got a vested interest in background in here. I'm relatively new. And I have never had a hesitation about discussing and answering really hard questions. You may not like the answers, but believe me, if you ask a question, if I know the answer, I'll answer. Or have an opinion, anyway. I'm, uh, I'm David Mosher from Hewlett Packard. And um, my question is just, to what extent is InfoWay funding the project? Or what percentage are they funding? Uh, the InfoWay funding is two things. One, there is uh, overall InfoWay funding for the development project. Um, which is about half the, the money. Um, what percentage that would be of the total development costs? Probably 25%, somewhere in that range. And not, they're not absolutely accurate. Um, quite unusually, though, um, because usually InfoWay does not fund uh, implementation, because they, what they fund in the other cases, they own the intellectual property of the developed tools. But because uh, of what I've been talking about, that it's so difficult and the other domains, and we're ahead of the other domains, okay? In other words, the other provinces and that, nobody is as far along it by any stretch than we are, okay? BC just let an RFP, so they're back where Ontario was four years ago. Um, for that reason, and because of the difficulties, InfoWay decided to fund the adoption or implementation so they could take lessons learned from it, they could take you know, change management strategies, um, they could take tools and, and templates that were out of this and give them to other uh, provinces and other areas. So in terms of, of the ad current adoption funding, it's probably in the neighborhood of 50%. Great. Quite frankly, as well, I know what the development project cost. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what the total uh, adoption project is because quite frankly, we need people like UHN and Gamma to tell us what it's going to cost to implement within their areas. And uh, you know, that gets to be an interesting uh, discussion as well. You know, clearly, we don't have enough money to pay for everybody to do everything to upgrade every system they have. So. I have a question from the web. And uh, the question is, uh, is there a URL where people can get access to the standards? Um, yes. There's a dark site that we have put up which, um, if I remember correctly, it's the um, uh, Ministry of Health um, URL uh, forward slash login, uh, and there is a password that uh, um, you need to access this site. Uh, and I think probably the best thing for me to do is to provide you, Shirley, with the, uh, the login uh, and have you be able to distribute that to anybody who's registered in this session. And on that site you will find the uh, HL7 message specification and we are about to post the nomenclature standards so you will be able to get access to those tables as well. And all of our early adopters and foundation people have been working with that, been working with us towards that in terms of they clearly understand what the standards are that we're trying to implement on and, and all the conformance testing and that has been out there for that group anyway at this point in time. Okay, so uh, people in the audience or uh, from the web, I guess, so send me, uh, we'll, we'll organize somehow getting that information out. Back here. Oh yes, I'm uh, Tom Cloutier from AGFA Healthcare. And part of my question was already answered. You, you mentioned HL7 before. It, and I guess the question of that, is that the primary standard or that is the standard that you're using for communication? Yep. Okay, so part two of the question then is, um, uh, I would think with the lab designation, this would primary be, primarily be text-based um, information results, uh, lab results of, uh, say, blood tests and that type of thing, as opposed to image-based um, lab results. Perhaps. Sorry, it, it, it's actually um, text-based or numeric-based. Uh, uh, it's not imaging, although there are uh, some images associated with pathology reports, and OLIS does have some capacity to capture those images, but there's nothing like the images that diagnostic imaging uh, requires. Right, so it's, it's keeping it relatively separate at this stage. Yeah. Absolutely. 
several questions from the web. First, Julian asks, when will OLIS be rolled out to other hospitals? Okay, so um, the plan right now, and, and again, it, it's really a risk mitigation strategy and a learning strategy as we go forward. So the first two, uh, we're intending, you know, to go, li go out. We're working with them right now. And, you know, the intent is we'll probably get through the, with the first two up in the summer. The other four foundation then start in a staggered effect. The other, and we're talking about the very large ones. Um, uh, we'll stagger out over the next six to nine months. We then have what was referred to as the early adopters. I don't have all the names for you, but the next set of hospitals which are, are really size driven. But, and they are also driven by the fact that they represent all the vendors. In other words, we're very carefully selected so we can get the vendors in first. Would start rolling out in kind of uh, this time spring of, of next year. So the first year is really focused largely on that initial group of six. Part of the waterfall effect is, if you think about what I told you in terms of funding, um, by the nature of the funding sources, um, what we need to do is fo we needed to focus on the large players first, not because I like focusing on large players, they're sophisticated, but let's face it, in order to get funding, we needed to get the majority of results in as early as possible in order to establish the funding uh, plot. All right, so that's kind of partly drove out our strategy. Can I just add yeah. something to that and say once we get past the six foundation adopters, uh, we will actually be trying to um, plan for um, other hospitals uh, uh, to, to come on. And uh, yes, we will be moving forward with the rest of our early adopter group. But where, uh, for example, we have a vendor who has put up a solution for someone already, then we know that other clients of that vendor may be ready sooner to come on. Uh, and so we will be actually going out and trying to plan um, after our six foundation adopters are hooked up exactly how we're going to get everybody else on. And we may find that it comes uh, in a regional cluster or in a vendor cluster, uh, but we will be actively seeking um, uh, input as to uh, how that will actually roll out. We also suspect that what's going to happen is a lot of cases either through vendor uh, user groups or relationships or because um, there is a federated model. In other words, where we may focus on Lake Ridge, there's actually a federated model with other, other institutions that if we're successful at the top of the federated model, then those that are within that federated model or within that particular user uh, uh, group may go very much quicker. Okay? In other words, the, the pull will be there. Uh, one of the clinical management systems, which were actually not on our radar to start with, has approached us about going faster. Okay, in terms of, of getting on board. Part of it is strictly, we still have a lot of lessons to learn about making this work uh, with all the issues that we talked about and it's, it's also just straight our capacity to bring that many people up that fast uh, safely uh, is, is what will dictate it to a certain extent. But real terms, the intent is to have the majority of the opportunity in the next 24 months. Okay, the next question is, for institutes and vendors interested in developing interfaces for uploading test data to OLIS database, who do we contact? Well, certainly um, you can contact me and uh, we'll provide my coordinates. Uh, and um, um, the specifications uh, uh, that you need to build to um, uh, are, can be found on that website. Uh, and we also have uh, business analysts who are specialists in HL7 uh, and we can hook you up uh, with them uh, in order to facilitate an in-depth review of those specifications. We've been doing a lot of bilaterals with the major vendors already, so it's just a matter of extending that process. Lindsay, could you give an email address? Uh, yes, uh, you can reach me at lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, dot Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, at S-S-H-A dot C-A. Okay, the uh, next question, actually there's two, they're related. Uh, can you provide a more detail, oh, sorry, can you provide more detail related to the other fu order functions that will not be ready at day one? And um, yeah, what will not be ready at the end of March? Basically the same question. So, do you want to take the release strategy? <laughs> well, the release strategy largely is um, release one will allow us to interface with an LIS system, so a gamma, for example, and get results in and out. Uh, in terms of that. It will allow a limited amount of web viewing. It will not allow through the website 
uh, uh, an individual physician to place an order into the system, and, and that, that is really release 1.2. If you want to know what release 1.1 is, 1.1 is a technical release. We have to get the two data centers fully mirrored, backup recovery, and, and all that kind of thing in place. So there's a whole kind of technical infrastructure piece that's going in in release 1.1. 1, 1.2 1. 1, really brings up the web portal capacity. Um, in terms of those that are on secure mail, it's not as much of an issue. The intent, however, is to be able to provide full um, secure internet access, and that will come up as release 1, 2 as well. But our strategy in rollout is basically to go after the lab service providers first, because we feel that physicians doing ordering and physicians who want to retrieve results aren't going to want to use OLIS unless they have a, a certainty that the person they want to connect with is on the other line, is on the other end of the line. So our strategy is to go after getting the results into the data repository, and we feel that that will provide an attraction to OLIS for the physicians who are doing the ordering, first of all, to retrieve their results, and then when they have the capacity to electronically order, they can then begin that, begin that function. So our, our focus first is very much on results in. And the results, the, the transaction itself has the order results in the same transaction. So, so uh, you know, the early adopters, for example, will not Im implement orders separate um, kind of implementation, probably till the fall. Majority of the functionality, however, I would say that 90% of the functionality exists. Other questions from here? Don't miss anybody. You've mentioned a, a couple of times about, sorry, my name is Derek Ritz, I'm an I'm a, a independent practitioner. You, you uh, mentioned a couple of times you're using um, mail and secure mail. Is that the message, is that the way you're carrying the messages, or is it uh, going to be a web service, a real-time service? It, it's going to be a web service eventually, okay, in terms of it. So right now you would come in uh, through the interface, through the, the PKI interface between an application to an application interface. Um, where we will be able to come through the, to, to access the secure portal kind of thing. If you're already authenticated on one mail, that's one, one process that's kind of already there. Um, what isn't there right now is the fact that if you want to access this from your, ho your hotel room through the internet from Hotmail or Secure, we haven't quite figured out all of the security wrinkles around that one. So, but that's the intent. The reason I, I mentioned one mail is, is not so much one mail as the interface, but because if you're on one mail, you're already registered and authenticated. Okay, so we can, we can bring you in from that, from the secure messaging side. One question I have is, uh, how are you going to get the data out of the laboratory information systems at the beginning? Do you just go around querying all of them, or what's the process for uploading the data at the beginning? Well, the, the, um, the sending of the data to OLIS will be a push. In other words, the laboratory information systems will, will send it across an HL7 interface into OLIS. Uh, they will have to build the, their, this interface to our specification. Uh, so getting the data into OLIS is a push, but getting it out will always be a pull. But how do they, 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 they just dump their entire database up to you, or do they selectively send information? How does the OLIS get populated at the beginning? Well, the, the population will be that um, all the test results uh, that are uh, contained in a, um, uh, an LIS will be sent to OLIS either in real time or in batch. Um, and uh, we, we want all disciplines, all results. But we're not going back in history. In other words, we're not asking no. them to dump their existing no. database. Oh, that was, that's, that's what that's I was getting at. Oh, no, no. no, no. It, only we're, starts, we're, it starts, starts forward it, as opposed to... On a going forward we, basis. People looked at, and I think you actually talked to me about this, the idea that we would go back, given the diversity of standardization of data, and dump 200 databases in, in here is just like, like it's a non-starter. It won't work, okay? So if the decision has made is that as results go forward, Okay, they will push the results to us. Now, somebody can argue, well, what happens if they don't? Um, let me say this politely. Opting out is probably not an option in the long run. Um, I think we're working on the basis of this makes sense and everybody cooperating. 
I don't want to imagine what would happen if somebody or large players decided, well, we're not playing. I think the ministry would have some very difficult decisions to make at that point in time. Uh, but the intent is that results going forward as they occur will be pushed to the system. Sorry, I have one more from the web here. Uh, the question is, in terms of first adopters in 2006, will all transactions be expected, including the order functions that may not yet be ready at the end of March? Basically, what, what is going to occur with our six foundation adopters is that all the information related to the order will be embedded in the message that comes across to OLIS. So it will have information about the result but it will also have information about the order. In other words, who the requesting physician was, what was the date and time of collection, those sorts of things. So it will come across in an integrated message that contains both order and result information. So you get order information and results, but you're getting it in a single message. What will happen in release one, two down the road is the system and, and the interface systems will be able to submit order captured separately fulfilled results attached and then viewed order results. All right, so that's the subtle difference between the two. And, and I think that it's very important to realize that the submission of orders alone is, is expected to come from um, practitioners in their offices. Um, we do not need to get separate orders from a hospital. Uh, we are mostly looking for the the, the individual order messages to be sent from community-based physicians. Hi, I'm Rick Lambert. I'm, I work in a community hospital and have been involved in OLIS discussions since 1992. So um, I'm really pleased. Definitely to before my time. <laughs> really pleased to see the progress that we're making, but understand we still have a long road ahead of us. Absolutely. But I have two uh, questions. One, first one is. What access will I, as a patient, have to my lab results within OLIS, if any? Well, um, at the moment, uh, you will have access to those results uh, in the presence of your physician who will be available to interpret them for you. So I will have none directly? None directly at this point in time, although I'm very aware in other jurisdictions that that is being, uh, uh, is being done. I'm also aware of initiatives um, in Ontario uh, that are giving uh, patients limited access to information uh, through hospital-based systems uh, for the management of chronic disease. And there's a commitment and part of the ministry that says if a patient can't get access through um, their physician or through those means, that they're clearly we're going to have to develop a, a uh, patient access. So if, if, you know, in the lack of being able to get out the data from anybody else, uh, we're in the process of designing um, how you can get the access. It's not really a systems problem in the sense that I can query, I can create a query that will get you the results. The question is, through what mechanism or who do I present you those results? And that's a question that we're committed to answering, but which way I can't give you an answer for right now. But it's clear it's in the privacy side, uh, and actually in the presentation of the commissioner tomorrow, which says that, we have, that, that, that we're committed to figuring that out so that patients will be able to see their results and validate their results. Okay, uh, second question, when do you feel that uh, the public health laboratories will be in a position to be able to participate in this? As a community hospital one who already has a point-to-point -point interface with a major reference lab, one of the key drivers for us to participate in OLIS is getting public health on board. And to this point, they haven't had the, quite frankly, the IT infrastructure or standardization to be able to do that. Well, um, as you're probably well aware, uh, there are plans to upgrade the information systems in the public health laboratories. And I believe that OLIS has actually been a catalyst to move that agenda forward. Uh, and I'm hoping that we will, uh, we live daily in the expectation uh, of, of the release of an RFP for that. Uh, we we uh, may sort of um, uh, be like waiting for Godot, I don't know. Uh, but um, clearly there are plans afoot to upgrade the public health laboratory's information systems. Um, should that not happen in a timely manner, 
we would ultimately have um, uh, the web as a, as a stopgap solution or a partial solution. Uh, but it's a well-recognized issue. Uh, and in fact, in the stakeholder impact assessment that we did um, about a year ago now, um, uh, this was seen as, uh, yes, the number one incentive for laboratories to interact with OLIS was the opportunity to interact electronically with the public health lab. It, it would be ironic if the um, Ministry of Health initiative with OLIS, um, the last participant was the ministry's own laboratories. <laughs> it has occurred to some people. Uh, one of the things we should say, that we mentioned the interface with the other initiatives. Um, we're being fairly careful in our words in the sense that, that we're pretty much um, dedicated to creating a, an ability to exchange information. I'm using that very carefully. Um, there's been a tendency to talk about full integration across some of these things. That's a ways out. I mean, uh, we can get data to, to people and we can get data to Cancer Care Ontario, but the idea that in the short run, we're going to have full integration between OLIS uh, and those other systems in various states is not true. However, we have workarounds where if it's needful, we can get at the information that's in OLIS and present it based on, 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 on what's needed. I mean, it's a workaround. It's not, not clearly the end result. Actually, we have two. I'll give you the easy one first. <laughs> Will patient identification utilize the provincial EMPI or OHN? Well, the primary identifier that we have built to is the OHN. That's simply because there isn't a province-wide EMPI yet. <coughs> uh, and while there is a wait time EMPI that is being rolled out right now, which is an excellent beginning, um, we do not actually know when there'll be a provincial EMPI. Um, OLIS has had to develop um, uh, uh, a way of positive patient identification um, in advance of there being a province-wide EMPI. We will be very happy um, as that initiative comes up alongside us to look at ways of, of uh, using it um, as expeditiously as possible. And to the extent that the people that are working on EMPI right now, and I'm right up to my level, I took and talked to Sarah Kramer and that, we're, we're working with them constantly uh, from the way they're approaching the standards to make sure that uh, they know where we're at, we know where they're at, that we, both of us haven't, you know, built ourselves into a blind alley. Uh, so can, we, we will eventually, assuming the MPI project is successful, uh, we will likely move to that. But there, we're probably in an interim situation until then. Okay, and this question comes with a warning. That <laughs> this might get confusing, but here goes. The Ontario MD certification process for physician systems demands a real-time interface with a community lab. But isn't this redundant with the advent of OLIS? Well, yes. Actually, actually the, uh, the contract requires a real-time interface with the three major community labs and a real-time interface with OLIS within six months of OLIS being live. Um, that contract was written um, a couple of years ago and took quite some time to actually be signed and move forward. What happened uh, as a result of that delay in the signing of that contract is that the advent of OLIS got stacked right on top of the um, uh, move for the CMS ASP contract, at least, to build interfaces with the three major community labs. So what we have is an aberration of timing. Uh, we are working with we are working with the community labs, and they have been pushing back and saying. Uh, you know, yes, we don't want to do this twice. And so our challenge is to work with the um, uh, CMS ASP vendor uh, and make sure that there are, uh, the work that they may do with any of the community labs is, uh, is portable to its solution for OLIS as well. Uh, but this, as I said, was written when we thought that the ASP solution would be in the field well in advance of OLIS being ready. I remember I said one of the things that I said earlier on that's happened, and it's, it's just, you know, the way, that, the way that the world works, okay, is I don't think anybody, if you had asked uh, last summer, pick your constituents and ask whether they thought OLIS would have been ready to be an operational system in 06, if you could have found one person who said yes, I would have been very surprised. 
And this is, this is just an example of exactly that, okay? And we'll have to go back and fix it. And most of them, are, I, I think the, the view is that, you know, if all this works as advertised further out the road, that, that you know, that, that is the key interface. And there, you know, it makes life simple for them. Is that the only success criteria? No, I'm not saying that. Any other questions? Uh, Sort of following the comment that you're not going to be uploading the history, one of the things that's that's outlined as a benefit is that you, there will be the ability to pull the history, and yeah. it sounds like it's going to be a decades before that benefit is going to be realized. Sometime. <laughs> is there any future expectation that that historical information will eventually be loaded up so that I, I, the the historical benefit, yeah. which I think is an important one, or it seems to me, yeah. would be. With, From the ministry's right? viewpoint, in terms of you know the research and 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 that side of the house, I think they would like to do that. Uh, remembering at that point the accuracy is less required because you're not tagging it down to a clinical decision made on on the results. So putting a history in the pseudonymized repository or et cetera of what pastors your order is is probably something that they will eventually think about. If you're actually trying to put data into this system. Uh, based on somebody making a decision or being influenced in a decision by that history, you have to, to be a heck of a lot more certain about the accuracy. Um, I was quite serious when I said I, I've done very large systems before where effectively had one owner, but you know, 10 regional or 20 regional systems, and the data issues um, are, are horrendous. Okay? Uh, it's not that you can't technically store the data, you can. But the fact is that the standards, and if you further you go back in history that, that exist, um, you, you can, you're going to end up with potentially corrupt or, or bad data for 40 or 50 percent of what you've got. Um, and so therefore you then question whether or not it's worth the effort to, to put into the cleanup of data in order to make the history valid. So I'm not saying nobody, it will never be considered, but right now the decision was largely that, that it was a very difficult task with limited chance of success in, in the short run and would eat up huge amounts of resources and cost. Simple. I mean, so should it be there? Could it be there if it was possible? The answer is absolutely. I just don't think that, that based on what we know, that it's practical to do it at this point. And, and you've got to realize that history and lab tests, many lab tests have a very short shelf life for clinical relevance. Uh, and so when we talk about looking at history, in many cases we're talking about looking at reasonably recent history. Um, certainly for pathology, of, uh, a result has a clinical validity for the entire life of the patient. Uh, but many, many lab test results um, are not worth knowing or seeing, uh, um, you know, six months or a year after the fact. Interesting. Uh I want to thank you very much. By the way, I think you guys are kind of easy on these guys. We had them wear <laughs> ground chains. Were a friendly audience, otherwise we had them wear ground chains as a safety measure, but it really wasn't <laughs> necessary. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn things back to Shirley. Well, I want to thank our uh, guests today as well, Lindsay and uh, Ernie, uh, and I thank the audience for being uh, uh, so polite, giving <laughs> well, and for giving so many questions as well, uh, particularly the ones from the web. Sure. And